What's up, Badger fans? Welcome to Locked On Badgers. We got Justin. I am Ryan. We're talking about new receivers, coach. We got to talk about that. Plus, what kind of room is he inheriting? And where does Justin think the community effed up on their prospect ranking? We're going to talk about all that and more on today's Locked On Badgers. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Lockdown Badgers. Thank you for making this one of your first listens every single day. We really do appreciate it. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Uh, make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 back in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown to get started. We had a new court, uh, receivers coach. I was say quarterbacks coach. We had a new receivers coach, Kenny Guyton. Um, Played quarterback at Ohio State, if that name sounds familiar to Badger fans. Has been a receivers coach since 2017. Stops at Houston, Louisiana Tech, Colorado State, and since 2021 at Arkansas. Also took over interim offensive coordinator this year uh, towards the last later half of the season. It feels like an interesting hire. Um, I think it's hard to say for sure, right? Like, Because you don't really know. But, Justin, what do you think with the initial thoughts here of Kenny Guyton? I like him as a recruiter. I don't know enough about him as a coach to really know what the, I do know. They had a first team, all sec guy within the last couple of years that he was responsible for. And that will tell you kind of all you need to know about, you know, what he's capable of in terms of coaching, but he brings talent into the room. And you and I were looking over the list of guys that have, they've brought in for commits. He consistently gets guys with size and, and length in the wide receiver room. And I think that that's something that Wisconsin badly needs. And if you have a guy who's capable of bringing in, you know, that type of receiver and adding something to the room that we we really don't have a lot of, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally think I wasn't overly impressed by Mike Brown as a recruiter this cycle. I think that Guyton has a chance to be a big step up because I think if I'd like Kyan Barry Johnson, but I think that the fact that that's the only guy that was on the list for Mike Brown kind of tells you all you need to know. Like he should be one of those guys that's doing some heavy lifting in that regard. Kind of like Spalding had a bunch of running backs and, you know, Hitchler. Yeah. Like the guy's basically accounting for the entire class. Him and Spalding. Don't, they need to be bringing in more than that. They need to be going out there and being the leads on more than one guy. So I think that Guyton's capable of going out there, getting accounting for two, three guys in a cycle. And I think that that's a big deal for Wisconsin if you can get a, another plus recruiter in the room. Yeah, I went. I know we both kind of did going back through his his recruiting history at Arkansas. He's brought in at least one four star receiver every year he's been there. You know, now some people, and I, it's a question I want to get into: Is it easier to get that four star talent in the South at Arkansas in the SEC than it would be at Wisconsin? I think it's a question worth asking. But he does have a track record of bringing in some talent. Um, one of the things we talked about before, <clears throat> when I think we were talking about a different position, but every every single position you need to be able to coach and recruit, right? There's no position where you can't recruit at all or you yeah. can't coach at all. But there are certain positions where the scales are different, right? Yeah. I think for us, tight end, running back, I say receiver as well. Those mm-hmm. have to lean more towards, if you have to mm-hmm. kind of lean one way or the other, you want a dynamic recruiter in those spots. Because yes. honestly, if you get dynamic talent at the receiver spot, a lot of those dudes don't need as much coaching because it's just yeah. – you know, I'm not saying again. I want to be super clear because Derek Raid's going to yell at me. I'm not saying coaching doesn't matter. Yeah, but it it clearly does. But when you get dynamic receivers in the room, like we, how many? There are a lot of wide receivers that we watch at the college level that are dynamic. That you look at them like he's not the crispus route runner, but he's so athletic it doesn't matter. He's just able to 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 get away. We we talked about Tret Kahuna as he his senior high school film. I watched his route running in that in that, and I'm like. He rounds off some routes, but he creates such easy separation. It doesn't matter. Like nobody can get within five yards of him. And if that's the way that it's going to be, where you can get some guys that are capable of creating that separation, it makes his job easier. And if you can get the talent in the room, it will show. I got a couple of tweets here. I was uh, canvassing the Twitter sphere reaction, both Arkansas, Wisconsin fans. I apologize, Justin. I didn't have the time to shrink these down. So they're going to cover our faces for a second, but (laughs) Um, this is from Riley McFerrin, Arkansas wide receivers, Andrew Armstrong, Isaiah Santega, Davian Dozer. These are all four-star type receivers, by the way, especially Santega and Dozer. Sound off on Kenny Guyton's expected departure. Notable quote from Santega, if it wasn't for Kenny, I would not be a Razorback. Uh, for reference, Santega is from the 2022 class, and he was a top 140 receiver, 140 player in the country, a, a high four-star player. This is from the Dairy Raid, obviously a good friend of the show. Says, young and upcoming coach who in a short time has proven to be a solid recruiter, especially in the South. 
Love that. I got two more here. This is from Football Scoop. Kenny Gain did a nice job at Arkansas. Will be missed. And this is from Woo Pig Weekly. I still can never get over Bielema going there. So Arkansas receiver coach is leaving for uh, Wisconsin. Same role. Stepped up to fill the OC role last half of the season. His recruiting ability and rapport with our receivers will be missed. So I didn't cherry pick those. I didn't see anything overtly negative on Twitter, although I did see some Arkansas fans on message boards say, eh, I don't know if I'm going to miss them. Yeah, I, I always look at that, and you, I mean, I'm sure some of it's sour grapes, but there, there's there's always some gripes. Like, no coach has 100% Q rating when it comes to this type of stuff. There's always people that aren't going to love something. You have one receiver that has more drops than a guy than people think he should, and that's going to get reflected on the coaches. Just like you and I have always said, that's not on a coach. Like, he can have you catch a thousand balls in a week, and if you don't catch the ball, that's not his fault. Like. If he put the part that he's responsible for is were you in the position that you were supposed to be in order to be able to make the play? That is on him. Do you know the assignments? Yeah. It's it's a little things too, right? It's like getting off a of press coverage. It's it's being more efficient in your route right. running. Catching the ball is not on the receiver's coach at the college level. It is on the yeah. high school level, right? You're, yeah. you're developing how, where do you put your yeah. hand? Yeah, appropriate technique yeah. And, and effort level. At yeah. the college level, catch the damn ball. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like that's not on the coach. Yeah. Um, but to me, I like the hire. I like the hire on the surface. I don't know if it's a home run, but I don't. I don't know if there's a home run hire out there necessarily either. Like it feels like a good hire to me. The other thing I'd say, he's got recruiting connections in the South, in Texas, in Arkansas. Those are really fertile areas. He he pulled multiple mm-hmm. four star receivers out of the Texas area the last yeah. several cycles. So that's not a bad thing at all to build some inroads there. No, definitely not. And and you know, I don't want to throw shade on Mike Brown. And I'm not going to because I don't know what the, his assignment actually was this year in terms of recruiting, but he only counted for one guy. And I think that that's an area that if you have a coach like Guyton that comes in, if he can account for a little bit more than that, you know, that's a chance to add another strong, you know, recruiter into that room where we're already had a really impressive first cycle. If he can get another couple of guys, you know, out of this and get us some more weapons in there and, or maybe even other positions where, He's able to help us along with a guy who maybe we wouldn't have gotten this last year. You know, that is something that is a positive impact that this guy potentially could have. Sometimes it's if you have a dynamic personality and you're a good quality recruiter, you want as many of those guys as you can have on your staff. And then you'll figure it out from the the coaching standpoint and everything else on the backside. You still have to have you need to be competent, but getting talent in the room is the biggest is the toughest thing to do at the college level. Well, there's a connection to Fickle too. We should point that yeah. out. Yes. Um, from their time at from his time at Ohio State when Fickle was on the staff there. So yeah. this is a guy that Luke Fickle knows. He's been around. He's been around him a lot. I think that that matters, right? There's comfort there. He knows what type of person this is. Justin, I want to ask you short answer. We're going to get into this more after the break. But what what kind of room is he walking into? Is it a good one? <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't know. Like everything was so disjointed this year on the offensive side with the, the new scheme and everything. Like the quarterback play wasn't good. The receivers didn't seem to be earth shattering outside of Pauling was pretty solid. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know how much of that's on the quarterback. I don't know how much of that's on the offensive line and timing issues and everything else that plays into the role of how much talent's actually in that room. I, I think there's a, a couple steps to go up clearly from what we saw this year, but I don't I don't think the room is littered with all American candidates in there. I think that you have a, you have a guy in Pauling who's a nice starter piece, and you hope some of the young guys like Anthony, maybe CJ Will, Williams makes a jump, maybe a guy like Burroughs makes a, or Quincy Burroughs makes a jump and becomes you know productive. There is athleticism in that room. Mm-hmm. I think that that's a good starting point. Now it's is Guyton a better mix with Longo in order to get to get the the promise that these guys have out of them? Yeah, I would say that I think you and I are kind of similar on this one. I, I think it's a mediocre average Big Ten receiver room with, with potential. Yeah. But that potential needs to be realized, and sometimes it's not. I, mm-hmm. I don't look at it next year and say I, I believe in these one or two or three people to be really, really good performers. Mm-hmm. I just don't think you have that in the room. And I think that that's simply we just haven't seen it. Like mm-hmm. I I am not willing to go into a room and say this is an A-plus room unless there's two returning guys that have had huge years and there's a couple of guys that showed some promise behind them. Like yeah. that, that that's an A plus room to me. Like they, we need people who are going to be productive that we know can get open and make plays at the big 10 level. We didn't see a lot of that this last year outside of Pauling. So 
there's a lot of opportunity in that room. I'll just go ahead and say it is not an A plus room or no. an A minus. No, it's room. definitely not. I was thinking for great for our friends over at fans. We're going to come back. Uh, Justin disagrees with Brian Smith's F for the receiver rec uh, recruiting in this cycle a little bit. We're going to talk about that coming up. Lock the Badgers. Keep talking receivers. Then we're going to get into the community prospect list a little bit more. But first, a quick break for our friends of the show over at FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 bucks for free if you're winning money line $5 bet hits. It's simple. That's easy, right? Just go make a $5 money line bet on the Niners next week. Cash in the, cash in the bank. You get your $150 back. Um, I know they let you down last week, but that's why I didn't tell you to bet on them last week. I'm telling you to bet on them next week over at FanDuel. They get spreads, parlays, teasers, futures. It's all there. I know people um, who have gone to other sites, and it's difficult to get started. It's confusing. The user interface is terrible. And when you do win, you hit that parlay. The money comes through like three different third-party sites, and your bank blocks it. It's a mess. FanDuel has none of that. It's easy, simple. For when you do win, for when you do follow my advice and get those winnings, get that money, FanDuel makes it incredibly easy to pay it off. The app is easy to use, and that's why we use it. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Continue the NFL season. It is the official sports betting partner of the NFL for a reason. Fast, simple, easy to use. FanDuel.com slash locked on. All right, Justin, let, let's talk. In a recent show, Brian Smith basically going through the ups, the downs, and everything in between of the recruiting class. I asked him what's missing, and he said – this is an F, basically, for the receiver recruiting, right? He, he said, this is terrible. This is a failure. Um, and to be fair to Brian, what he's saying is relative to where Wisconsin wants to go. Yeah. Like, this this is an F type effort. And I, I, I definitely see his perspective and his point. I know you had said you disagreed with it a little bit. Um, so I'm curious to give you the floor on that one. Well, I think you need to look at it from a, a positional group. And I think when you're looking at the slot position, I would say that Kyan Barry Johnson is – in my opinion, he's not an A, but I would say he's a, a B plus type slot prospect. I think he's a really promising kid. He's got a lot of talent to him. Probably like to see him a little bit more filled out and a little bit more developed in terms of physically to if he wanted him to be an A and it'd be a guy who can really show up. But there's a lot of talent in him. Now he's not wrong from the standpoint of we need more size on the outside. I do take I disagree a little bit with his thought that the only way to get those big, big time size guys on the outside is to go out there and get the the elite four star guys. We we see it every year. There's multiple guys in in college that end up developing. They may not be guys day one ready to come in and play, but they get you find a six three or six four guy with good speed, and he ends up going in the draft. And he didn't play for Alabama. He didn't play for an SEC school. He's just a guy that got developed over the course of time. He, he may be a group of five school that just developed in something. Iowa State did this for a while where they kept pumping out guys who were like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, didn't necessarily have elite speed, but made plays and were like all-conference-type receivers. So I think what you need to do is you need somebody who's really good at identifying, and you need to find a receiver that's hungry, that has some size, and maybe is, is maybe he's kind of like that baby deer where you look at it and you're like, it's not there, but I can kind of see it every once in a while. He does this, this or that. Like we, we you and I have talked about, the wide receiver room. And what you need to find is you need to find a guy who has one elite skill. Yeah. Like that's something I can, I can count that he'll be able to do at the college level. And if I can develop something else, he could be a really good player. So whether that's speed, whether that's hands, you know, you got to find something that, that, that guy can do really well. Now, Wisconsin right now, their issue is size. And I think you could say speed, but really, it really it's, you need a guy who can stretch or the field, old. whether, yeah. <laughs> Well, really what it comes down to is you can choose either one. It's a guy with jets who can get open because he's got good enough footwork to get by somebody who's trying to play bump and run on him. Or it's a guy who can just flat out out physical the cornerback and go make plays. He doesn't have to have jets, but he's got to be able to abuse that corner physically well, if that's going to be the case. A great badger example, that's Quintus Cephas. Yeah. Cephas was a 4-5 guy, yeah. but he was physical. Well, and, I don't right? even know if he was a 4-5 guy. I think he was close. He's like a 4-6, I think, is what he ran yeah, for them. Like, he wasn't a burner. No, like, yeah. I don't know how he sliced it, but he was just so physical at the point. And he could jump. He, he, was, he, was he really, had the right kind of explosiveness, yeah, physicality explosiveness. And to your point, like, Kion has carrying skills. Like, I really like Kion. Kion, mm -hmm. Kion Barry Johnson's a really good player. He's one of the most polarizing players in this class. Like, when mm -hmm. we did our community rankings, there was people that had him at number one. And there was – I don't know, 40% of people that didn't have him ranked in the top 10, mm -hmm. right? We know Rivals, Clint Cros Cosgrove, who used to work for Rivals, lo absolutely loves him. He's really sharp mm -hmm. with the evaluations. But there's other people I've seen that are like, 
I don't know. Like he's 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 There's a reason three of the recruiting services had him as a three-star. Where are you at on Kyberry Johnson specifically? Because when I look at all these players, I feel like he is the most maybe polarizing player in this class. I, I'll, I'll really quick, on, on for me, like – I think a lot of what he does will translate. I think the hands translates, obviously. The, the speed and space translates. But there is, at at some point, there is a size limitation that limits your ceiling unless you are so electric. And I'm not sure he's in that category. Well, that's exactly how I look at it. I think he's a slot guy because you want, if you're looking at what, he's going, what will maximize him at the college level, that is the spot where you put him. If he's, if he's going to be on the outside, there are, it's going to, I think it takes 20% away from what he is. If you put him on the outside, because you can put a bigger, more physical corner. on. He's never going to be a huge guy. This is a guy who will probably top out at 180, 185 pounds at the college level. I would be shocked if he gets bigger than that. And that's going to make him somebody who a cornerback, if you get a six foot corner on him or a six, one guy who's in that 190, 195 range, he's going to be at a physical disadvantage, especially mm-hmm. if they have good length. Now I, I like him. I think he'll be able to make plays on the outside. If you put him there, I just don't think that that's where you're going to get the most out of him. Well, if you had that bigger corner on him, too, you negate one of his biggest advantages, that ability to win contested catches, mm-hmm. go up over a shorter guy. It's just I, – I re- again, I don't want to frame this as I don't like Kyle Barry Johnson this no, class. I think he's a really good piece. He has a lot of promise, yeah. He's a really good piece, and I think it one shocks me at all if he becomes a really good batch. Maybe he becomes a Will Pauling type of player. You know, mm-hmm. A little different in certain ways, sure, but like that type of production. But this team so desperately needs that bigger guy on the outside. And that's, I think, again, going back to what we talked about, what Brian talked about, you have to get one or two of those guys every cycle and just see what happens, right? We, like, you go back to Tommy McIntosh. That's a great example of rolling the dice on somebody. He could still pan out, by the way. Mm-hmm. But that's the type of guy you got to get more of that and just say, all right, he's big or he's fast. You mentioned the carrying skill. He's like, he has a carrying skill. He's 6'5", mm-hmm. and he can run a little bit. You need more of that consistently. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brooks is another one, Chris Brooks. Yeah, exactly. he's, he's a guy who's 6'2", but he's probably 215 and able to really be physical with a cornerback. And he's got some ability to go up and get the football. There's not many – there's maybe Ohio State has corners that are big enough to to handle him if you get into the situation where he wants to out-physical somebody. And he's a guy that the coaching staff was really on high on this last year, and he got injured in camp, and he just never kind of got back to it. So hopefully he gets an opportunity to show some things. Quincy Burroughs is another guy who has a lot of physical tools – like he's he's six one six two, and runs in a four 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 five range. Yeah, so he's like a him. guy that if they they get him developed enough mentally and and he knows understands the wide receiver position enough, like his limitations were not physical this last year. They wanted to get him experienced and seasoned a little bit before just throwing him out there, because you don't like the last thing you want is receivers who don't know what they're doing out there mentally. Because if yeah. they make the wrong play and somebody breaks off a route or whatever, yeah, that's, that's an interception. Yeah, going the other way. Yeah, I. Yeah, it's interesting, man, because you you mentioned going back to the beginning of this conversation. It's really hard to tell where the breakdowns all were, right? Now, mm-hmm. uh, certainly the quarterback play made the receivers look worse, but I think the the converse is true. The receivers made the quarterback play look worse. I really look forward to year two under yeah. the long system for these guys. If I asked you, because I have a couple, I have I have two names in mind. If I ask you two receivers that you're confident are going to take a step next year. Who would those two guys be? Tretch Kekahuna. Yeah, that's one of mine too. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, it's it's tough. Good. If I'm looking at the outside, I think Vinny Anthony has a chance to to take a nice step. I actually think he could be the deep threat for us. I'm curious to see how much weight he puts on because I still think he's a little thin, but I think he's capable of carrying 190, and I think he's a legit six foot. So he's a guy. He's not going to be like a guy who's he's got huge size. But I do think that if he gets his footwork down and knows and learns how to avoid the jam, he's capable of getting by somebody and running. He can really run. That's a good so. One. Um, and then I would say if Brooks and Tommy McIntosh are a couple of guys that we just don't know. Like Brooks, I think there's opportunity there for him to be a dude. I think he's physical enough, and he's kind of almost like we talked about him. He's got kind of that Anquan Bolden body. Yeah. Where it's like, what do you do with that? Like, he if you're a cornerback where you're 190 pounds and this guy's got 25 pounds on you and he's just throwing his body in you, it's like being posted up if you're a six foot guard and you have a six three guy on you who's just slamming into you the whole time. Yep. You, you just you can't do anything with it. Yep. He does have that body. And, he, and that's why I actually you nailed two of mine. I said you picked two, Justin, not three. But anyway, um, you, you hit two, my, my two. It was Chris Brooks and Tretch. 
I, I think the fact that we were hearing how high the staff was on Brooks early on, they came in and they were, I, it felt like they were like, oh my gosh, this, this guy has got a lot of, mm. of size and ability here. Let, let's start using him. Then he got hurt. It was done. Mm. I think he could have made noise this year potentially. Yeah, I, I think he would have. I don't know what it, I don't know what noise would have meant. Like it could have been five to ten catches. Yeah, it could have been like a but, game, but but he would have played this year. I feel confident in that. So those are my two. I'm going Tretch. I'm going Chris Brooks. Um, there's certainly other players with potential on this list, though. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. Come back. Uh, we're gonna talk to Justin. We're gonna put the community list we had back up. We're gonna ask Justin where he agrees and disagrees. You already got kind of my takes on it. Where I'm in disagreement again. Lafayette way too low. What's, what's with that? Ryan Corey, way too low. What's with that, you guys? But let's talk about it next. We'll get Justin's opinion on it. But first, a quick break or a friend to the show. And a quick second to say thank you for tuning in to Lockdown Badgers. Thank you for making this one of your first listens. Uh, if you're an everyday or we really, really do appreciate you. So thank you. All right, let's come back. Justin, we did the community show. I know you and I were texting a little bit about it. Like, here's the rankings. Um, I wanna, I'm going to put it up. You're back up here. Who on this list... Do you or what ranking on this list do you disagree with the most? Which one do you like the most? Oh man. Um, well, you and I talked about what my criteria was for this. And my criteria was who do I think is most likely to make an impact? And what by what I mean by that is is if if push comes to shove, who do I who do I think is very unlikely to bust? Um, I think looking at this list, I, I'm I really like Ernest Willer. But it's a position where we have guys like we're we're looking at our outside linebacker room right now of guys who are highly ranked who just haven't turned into anything. And so I'm always a little skeptical on defensive linemen until I see it. I think that both of the running backs are going to Dylan Jones. And I, honestly, I think all three will be productive in their time here. But I think both Dupree and Jones are going to be legit. I think that the talent is there that you can see in their high school film that this is going to carry over. Um you know, we talked about Thomas Heiberger, and, and I said that I think that his ceiling is really high. I love yeah. him. I, I I really like his ceiling and what he's what the potential is there, but he's also a guy that I don't know that it's it's a one hundred percent certainty that he's going to. Maybe it would be another. Now he's like you look at these guys, and if you look at what they bring to the team, if they do hit, and yes, that's when I look at this list and I see a lot of guys that I'm like, okay, I can see where you're going with this if you think these guys are, but I tend to look at it and guys who I think are very likely to be locked in and are going to give us something that I feel confident I'm getting something out of this scholarship. And that's where I think my list is a little bit different. Um, Agard is a guy who I would have very high on this list because Agard. I feel he he's is, he's, would he he's be higher yeah. Than five. Yeah. I probably would have him higher than five of guys who I think are going to be, he's going to provide value to us. I would probably have him in the top three. Because okay. I think he's very likely to be a guy who, at the very least, is a really good slot corner for us. And I think his ceiling is he's an all Big Ten type cornerback. Yeah. And that, to be fair, I did ask people use whatever whatever metrics you want to rank them, right? So I yeah. said, you want to use most likely to play, highest upside, biggest recruiting win. I tried to take a combination of all of it and kind of meld it together for my list. Um, I had a guard, I think at six or seven. I had, for example, I had Seager looks at two. Just because I think if he hits, he's an NFL quarterback. Oh yeah, if he hits, he's a he's a really good NFL quarterback. He's, he's a, he's a uh, and same with Mabry. If Mabry hits, you, we're talking about a guy who's a first round draft pick quarterback. Well, who's, same who's with same with well. on list. Huh? Who's your number one? Uh, I didn't actually give you an exact list. I said these are the guys that I would have in the running for this, and I'm like I'd have to really sit down and sift through them oh, to I, figure I, out I, where I, I would move them. Order. Um. I have guys that would be higher. I my top guys like if Emerson Mandel was at ten, I would probably have him top five, and that's because I think that he is very likely to be a really good college player. I just I look at his film athletically, and I'm like, I don't see a there's not some anything I see on this guy that I don't think he's going to to hold him back other than injury. I love his film. I need to see him pass block. Yeah, I, I think you can. I think you can hide some of that on the interior, but I just think he's so athletic. I look at it and I'm like, "How are you not going to be good at this? Because you're you move so well." But I still got to see it to be I, top five. I, I, I argue that. See it. Um, and and by the way, you and I talked about this too. This is a, a tough class to rank your top five. Like if yeah. you put Mandel at five, you're moving down maybe a Dupree or a Jones or a Lucas or a Willer, right? Like you're moving somebody out of that. That's a pretty pretty interesting prospect. I mean, I. 
I had like 18 guys listed when I started trying to rank up my top 10. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I could make a kind of a case for any one of these 18. We talked about this when we were discussing the class in general, and this is one of the most high upside classes I've ever seen for Wisconsin. It probably is honestly the most high upside class. And there's so much athleticism in here. It's really hard to look at guys and say, I think this guy's going to bust. Now there's going to be guys who don't diagnose as quick as you'd like to see them on the defensive side. And they're going to get passed over because somebody is just more instinctive. Mm -hmm. But from an athleticism standpoint, there's not a lot of guys that look at it and be like, I just don't, I don't know what it, that this guy is going to pan out. And nice. that's that's something in the past we could look at guys and be like, I don't know if I see it yeah. with some of these guys. There was more of a lunch pill guys in the past, yeah. for, better, for better and worse. Like a lot yeah. of those guys became really good players. Like, oh, yeah. But there are more ups. Like, look at this list right here. Look at the honorable mentions, Justin. A guy like Rob Booker is number 16 on this list. Yeah. And Rob he has a chance Booker. to be, he could turn into an all conference tight end. That's a, that's a borderline four star tight end. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a four star at one point, he dropped to three, but that's a six six basketball type athlete at tight end mm -hmm. and he's number 16 on this list mm -hmm. i mean that, that tells you the depth and the athleticism here now some of these guys aren't going to pan out every time i, I do these shows i'm yeah. like listen as high as we are all the guys the law of thirds like some yeah. of these are gonna bust it just is what it is but that's why you get more of the athletic guys so the ones that hit they hit at a higher ceiling yeah um, yeah well, and i think that you look at it from that is is when you when you up your recruiting acumen just because a guy busts doesn't mean he's a bad player it's mm -hmm. just that he he may be behind somebody who is truly special at that spot. That's like Ohio State. Some of the guys that they bring in, they bring in all these four stars. We don't know. Like they may have guys who are talented that just aren't playing because some of the guys in front of them are crazy talented and are yeah. NFL future top three round guys. And it's like, well, yeah, he, he would probably maybe be a guy who could carve out a really nice college career. But because he's got these guys in front of him, he's not going to see the field unless they're in mop-up duty. Give me a guy in this honorable mention range, the 17 to 11, that you you really, really like. As I know that the list. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for it to spin back around for me here. Um, it's going to be a two we, guy. We, gonna um, be there's going to be multiple I'm going to go, but I'll start with um, one of the first ones that comes up because I saw him earlier. Ryan Corey is, oh has a God. chance to be a very, very good interior lineman. Like you and I discussed it, and I said, when we talked about Haywood and the other guys, I'm like, it's really hard to, to figure out tackles, like who's going to end up really being great. I'm like, I feel really confident that Mandel and Corey are going to be really high quality interior offensive linemen. They, they both have the bodies. They have better athleticism than I can remember of any of our interior guys in a long time. And they've played interior, some of them to a little bit. And that, that to me is a huge benefit. Um, other than that, Lafayette was 11. Lafayette, I think he's, yeah, I think he, his floor is so high. Mm -hmm. Like he's going to be at the very least, he's going to be a solid player for you. I think he's better than anyone we had on the edge this year. Like he's just, he's just more, he's got more juice than anyone we have. And that was the thing that was missing. We, he's got foot speed. The guys that we have out there right now don't have foot speed. And that's, that hurts them. And maybe they're out there too much. Maybe that's why Peterson that's looked a step slow. Yeah, I think, he's too many, too many snaps. I think they got worn down a little bit. Um, I've actually like, yeah, there were moments. Gets had moments, Petroski had moments, but consistently being able to yeah. create havoc off the edge, it just wasn't there. And well, you, that's an honest take. You need a guy when when there is legitimately a third and ten where you have to have a play, you need a stop that's capable of winning. And I yeah. don't think that we had those guys. Like when they would get plays when the offensive lineman would kind of let up a little bit. And that's when they would make their play. But when they when they had to make a play, they rarely made one. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like there to, to flip it to the offensive side of the ball, like there was no I don't think there was any player opposing offensive coordinators for game planning to stop yeah. them. Like going out of their way to stop. Like, yeah. you know, guys in our past, Zach Bond would get chipped or they would roll action away from him. Right. Mm -hmm. There was nobody on this team opposing coordinators was saying, Man, we gotta keep a tight end on that side and maybe the running back can chip. I just don't think that existed this year. And it is mm -hmm. what it is. It's not the player's fault necessarily. Like uh, schemes change, systems change. Like some of that impacts players as well. I don't think there's enough depth there, but it it just didn't work out. Yeah, we're getting some interesting bodies in that room right now. And I'm not sure I'm in love with what they, they have. I like the new guys that are coming in a little bit better. They seem to fit more what we've had in the past, which is we're going to get those guys that are in that 230 to 245 range that are rangier, longer athletes that can really put pressure on a tackle 
to stay mm-hmm. with their athleticism and speed. And that's, that's I think, where, where things are a little bit different. Yeah, it, it'd just be nice to see. There were so many moments in, in last year's season, Justin, where the front seven was just always trailing mobile quarterbacks mm-hmm. or always a step slow to get to the edge. And mm-hmm. even if you tackle them, it was a seven-yard gain off tackle. I'm just excited to see an uptick in athleticism. That doesn't mean there's not going to be run fit issues or missed tackles still, but I'm just excited to see more athleticism. Mm-hmm. Right, we we got to pause it there, hold up there. This has been today's show. He is Justin. I am Ryan. Um, we really do appreciate everybody tuning in. Justin's going to stop by a couple of our recruiting individual player shows that we've been doing. Those are, are great. I'm excited to get Justin's take on those. On Wisconsin, thank you so much.